Okay, this is Periodic Table Lesson 2, and tonight we're going to review some highlights of the periodic table. Some of those highlights are exactly what we discussed in class today. So the first part of this I'm really going to fly through. It's going to be a review, and then we're going to discuss periodic trends. It might be helpful to have your periodic table out. I'm not saying that we're going to use it, but if I'm talking about something, you might want to just glance over at it. So again, this first part of this, you're going to be like, wow, we already discussed this. I already know this. Periodic table is easy. And actually, I'd like to finish this up so you guys can get another exam. And some of you struggled a little bit with atomic theory, so this would be a, a great place to uh, make up for that. So let's get started. Let's talk about um, the periodic table. So we know and we discussed this today in class and we made some marks on our periodic table. We know that metals make up most of the table. And we saw that. They are left of or below the staircase. Except for what? What's that one exception in the upper left hand corner? You got it, hydrogen. Okay. They are all solids at STP except for what? What was the one metal we said was not a solid, it was a liquid. You guessed it, that was mercury. We talked about that. It is a liquid at STP and we used table S to show how it was a liquid. Now some new vocabulary words here. Malleable means that it can be hammered or molded into sheets. Think of soda cans. Soda cans are thin sheets of aluminum that are then cut out and put into the shape of a can filled with soda. Another word is ductile, meaning it can be drawn into a thin wire. If you ever take part your um, earbuds there, you know there's like a bunch of like million wires underneath there and they're very very thin. They have luster. They're shiny. You saw that today on the little video clip that we saw. And they are good conductors of heat and electricity. Good conductors um, of heat and electricity. So you never want to be outside in a thunderstorm with um, a metal rod in your hand. Not a good thing. And that's due to their mobile valence electrons. Now in order for something to be a conductor you need to have mobile charge. This is going to come up again. So Metals conduct because they have mobile electrons and ions conduct because they have mobile charge. They're either positively or negatively charged. So you need mobile charge in order to conduct electricity. I'm going to say that again. You need mobile charge in order to conduct electricity. That's really, really important. Um, metals like to lose electrons and form positive ions. We already talked about that. Let's look at the example of sodium, Na. has an electron configuration of 281. What does everyone want? 8 is great, so we all want 8. So if sodium loses one electron, it now has 11 protons and 10 electrons and a positive 11 and a negative 10 gives me a net plus 1. So there's your positive ion. Okay, nonmetals, nonmetals, they are to the right of or above the staircase. We talked about that today. They are mostly gases and solids, except one. There's one liquid over there in nonmetal land, and we talked about it today. That's right, it is bromine. Okay, they are not malleable or ductile. They are brittle, which means they shatter easily, shatter easily, meaning they crumble. They lack luster, so if you lack luster that means you are dull. And they are um, non or poor conductors, so they don't like to conduct heat and electricity. And we know that nonmetals like to gain electrons and form negative ions. Let's put an example right here next to it. Let's look at fluorine. Fluorine's 2, 7. 8 is great. It wants to gain one. So Fl minus is going to be 2-8. 
which means it's going to have 9 positive 9 plus a negative 10 which is going to give me a net negative 1 and there's your negative ion we talked about the metals uh, the metalloids today the semi metals they have both properties of metals and nonmetals they border the staircase between the metals and the nonmetals except aluminum there at the top okay moving on states of matter we talked about that today we used table S and we determined whether something was a solid liquid or gas most elements are solids at STP an example of that would be carbon and it has a definite shape and a definite volume that's standard textbook definition then we've got liquids there are only two elements at STP bromine and mercury so an example we can pick either one of them there we're gonna put BR2 and why are we going to write it as BR2? Because it's diatomic, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which will also be a review. It has a definite shape, and I'm going way too fast here. It has a definite volume. It has a definite volume. It takes the shape of the container. And gases, H-N-O-F-C-L and all of group 18 your noble gases so an example here we can just put neon is a gas notice how we use an S for solid an L for liquid and a G for gas no definite shape and they fill their container completely completely just want to review here remember if something is mixed with water it will have an AQ after it for aqueous meaning with water. I'm going to put a big X through this. Don't care about the Venn diagram. Moving right along. Diatomic elements. What's another word for our diatomic elements? I know Raphael knows this. It is Brinkelhoff. B R I N C L H O and F. And remember that they are elements that can't exist alone in nature they travel in pairs they are too unstable to stand alone and contain two identical atoms so I could have BR2 I2 N2 dot 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 okay when we look on the periodic table the N, O, F, C, L, B, R, and I make the shape of a 7 and then up to H2. So sometimes the diatomic elements are called 7-up and sometimes they're called Brinkelhoff. Okay, so let's look at that where they are in the periodic table. So we've got N, O, F, C, L, B, R right there. At six, there's your seven, and then up to H. So seven up. So either you have to have to either memorize seven up or Brinkelhoff. We had this vocabulary word in the last unit. An allotrope is one of two or more different. An allotrope is one of two or more different formulas of an element, nonmetal in the same phase but with different structures and different physical and chemical properties. So if you change the structure, you change the chemical and physical properties. So allotropes of oxygen are O2, which is a gas, it's what we breathe, and O3, which is a gas, which is ozone. Allotropes of carbon are 
graphite, which is pencil lead, and, oh, it's right there, diamonds. Big difference. I know which one I'd rather have. Anyway, graphite, graphite is carbon atoms arranged in sheets and diamonds are carbon atoms arranged in a network solid. And I'll show you a model of that tomorrow. I have one in class. Okay, let's get to our periodic trends. So we're gonna talk about several periodic trends. We're gonna talk about atomic radius. We're gonna talk about ionization energy, electronegativity, and reactivity. There's actually four atomic trends. I think we're going to talk about three tonight. So it's one half the distance between neighboring nuclei of a given element. So that's what the definition of atomic radius is. One half the distance between neighboring nuclei of a given element. And here I want you to see something. This is the periodic table arranged by radius. So notice as you go down a group that the radius generally increases. Uh, there's a reason for that, which we will talk about. And as you go across in your metals, going from alkali through transition, it gets smaller. And we'll talk about that. Okay, going down a group, atomic radius increases. Why? There's more orbitals or more principal energy levels. Every time you add a shell, you're making it bigger. And it takes up more space. Duh. Okay. So what is shielding? Shielding is the electrons from the inner energy levels interfere or block the nucleus from the valence electrons. So this is important. So let's look at sodium again. Okay, and in sodium I've got two, eight, one. So I've got two electrons here, eight here, and one here. Now in my nucleus I've got my 11 protons, my 11 protons, 11 P, and that's positive charge. Okay, so positive and my electrons are negative. Remember opposites attract, so the, the positive protons are pulling on the electrons. Well, this guy out here, right, is it really going to have an attraction to that electron way out there? No, not so much. Why? Because all these electrons are in the way. You got two here, you got eight here. Well, that's what shielding is. Electrons on the inner energy levels, so your kernel levels, interfere or block the nucleus from the valence electrons. So the attractive force between the protons and the nucleus and the electrons in the valence shell weakens. Going across a period, atomic radius decreases. Why? Well, this one's the one that's always a little harder for students to understand. The nucleus, as you go across a period, is getting heavier because your atomic number is increasing, which means that you have more protons and neutrons. And the nuclear charge is increasing. Well, that makes sense. If I have my atomic numbers increasing, I'm getting more protons and neutrons, then my nuclear charge is increasing. Electrons, remember that they are very light. And they are being pulled in tighter filling the orbital to the maximum capacity. Now, the easiest way for me to explain this is to use sodium again. So I'm going to put that down here where you can see it. We got 11 protons, okay, in the nucleus. Here's sodium. And we got 2, 8, 1. And let's look at chlorine with 17 protons and that's two, eight, seven. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is 
the radius of chlorine is smaller than the radius of sodium and this is why they both have three principal energy levels so their electrons are located in the same amount of space here I've got 11 positive charges pulling on 11 negative charges. Here I've got 17 positive charges pulling in on 17 positive charges. So the strength of my magnet, so to speak, is greater here because I have greater nuclear charge. So it's going to pull these electrons in tighter. It's kind of like a girdle. When women put on a girdle to suck in everything, well, that's kind of what's happening here. These 17 protons are sucking in on those electrons and it's going to make the radius smaller. In fact, in college chem, this is actually referred to as the girdle theory, believe it or not. But you have to understand the girdle theory in order to talk about it. And I'll review that again in class tomorrow. So let's talk about that ionic radius. Remember, that's when we've lost or gained. Well, we talked about this already. This is a review. If you add electrons, the radius is going to increase because it's like gaining weight. When you get gain weight, you get bigger. Okay? You have the same nuclear charge pulling on more electrons. The nucleus has Sorry, if you add electrons, the radius increases. You have the same nuclear charge pulling on more electrons. So the nucleus has less pull. Because you got more electrons, but you didn't increase you didn't increase the size of your magnet. If you remove electrons, the radius decreases. Why? Because you have the same nuclear charge pulling on less electrons. So the nucleus pulls the electrons in tighter or closer. Also, you just have to remember that when you become a negative ion, when you become a negative ion, you're gaining electrons, and when you gain weight, you get bigger. And here, when you become a positive ion, you're losing electrons, and when you lose weight, you get smaller. Ionization energy is the amount of energy needed to remove the most loosely bound electron from an atom or ion in the gas phase. So when we say loosely bound, we're talking about Balance. Balance electrons, people. Values for each element listed in, in table S. So we're going to go to table S for these. Now, how could we write this? You have to remember that elements are stingy with electrons. So if I take an, an element, some element X, and I add energy to it, I want to remove an electron. So there's my electron. It pops off. And now I've got a positive ion. So metals, right, the amount of energy needed to remove the most loosely bound electron. Well, remember, metals like to lose electrons. Metals like to lose electrons because they're going for eight is great so they're going to have low ionization energy nonmetals like to gain electrons because they're going for eight is great and they're going to have a very high ionization energy because nonmetals don't like to give up electrons they want to gain them
think of it this way, too. When, um, oh, we have to talk about the, the trends. I'll do that now. Going down a group, ionization energy is going to decrease. Well, why is it going to decrease? As you go down a group, valence, electrons, are further from the nucleus. Therefore, easy to remove. Electrons in kernel shells shield the nucleus from the valence electrons. Think of it this way. Everyone's seen a Christmas tree, right? Have a Christmas tree, you decorate it with balls. Think of the balls as electrons. Think of the trunk of the tree as the nucleus, okay? When you reach in and grab that trunk and you shake it, which balls are gonna fall off first? Hopefully you said the ones on the end of the branches. Why? because they are the furthest from the trunk. They are the furthest from stability. Those balls, those electrons, are the furthest from the nucleus. So as you go down a group, the valence electrons are further from the nucleus. It's easier to remove them. Why? Because that nucleus doesn't have any pull on those valence electrons because there's so many PELs. Going across a period, the ionization energy is going to increase. Why? Girdle theory. Okay. Electrons are being pulled closer to the nucleus. There is increased nuclear charge. There is more energy, therefore, needed to remove an electron. And we are almost done. So here's a graph of ionization energy, and you notice as you go from lithium, which is in period two, to neon, the end of period two, ionization energy tends to increase. And then it drops because you're going to go to period three, and as you go across period three, it increases, and then it drops again. Now, yes, I know you see some little fluctuations here. And if you really want to know why they're there, I will tell you about it tomorrow. It's a little bit of a college level um, understanding, but I think you guys can grasp it. Let's talk about electronegativity. This is the desire. Oh, this is the opposite. Sorry. Got ahead of myself there. This is the opposite of ionization energy. This is the desire to gain electrons, not lose want to gain electrons. It is the greediness of an atom or ion for electrons. And these are also listed in Table S. Greedy for electrons. Electronegativity values range from 0 to 4. The most electronegative element on the periodic table is fluorine. The most reactive nonmetal with four. The least electronegative elements are, you guessed it, your most reactive metals, which would be francium, Fr, or cesium. with around a point seven. Going down a group, what's happening to our trends? The electronegativity decreases. The reason? As you add an energy level, there are more shells or PELs. More PELs shield, sorry, 
shield the nucleus from the valence electrons. It's harder for the nucleus to attract additional electrons. So again, you've got your sodium, 2, 8, 1, Okay, it's hard to attract more electrons because the positive charges in the nucleus are too far from the valence shell because of the shielding of the kernel. Going across a period, electronegativity increases. Heading across a period, you are reaching the, what, what are we reaching? Reaching the octet. So the desire to gain electrons increases. Eight is great. The end. That's all, folks. See you tomorrow.